to In The Loop, Tales of the Blade, where we dive into the fascinating and often humorous history of figure skating. Let's introduce this week's hosts. Hi, I'm Evie, and I've spent the past week looking into the figure skating of the early 1900s and found so many hidden gems along the way. You can find me on Twitter at DoubleFlots. Hi, I'm Zilda, your friendly neighborhood political scientist. Long time no see. I'm glad to finally be back in the recording studio. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tequila, though bear in mind that I'm on a grad school social media hiatus. So, Tilda, welcome to our new series, Tales of the Blade, because obviously we need to go with the most dramatic, edgy title possible. I I came up with it. <laughs> it's a <laughs> good me. title. It's very good. Anyway, for those who, well, I guess everyone who's listening to this will probably not know what this series is about, but this is going to be a series of shorter episodes from In The Loop where we will dive into specific topics about the history of figure skating because there is a lot of really interesting things that happen in the past in figure skating that not a lot of people know about. So we're here to tell you all about it and have a chuckle along the way, hopefully. And the twist is the fact that one of the hosts knows all about it and has researched it and the other host doesn't. So Tilda, you do not know much about this topic, correct? That we are going to be diving in today. We kept it all secret from you. Yes, I know absolutely nothing. So I will be <laughs> reacting <laughs> genuinely to this as we go along. So I'm very excited and also excited that I didn't have to do any work research. <laughs> <laughs> you get a bit of a slack week. It's lovely. Yes. Anyway, so I wanted to just start off by asking you, Tilda, how much do you know about like the early days of figure skating, like around the ISU's inception, like eight, late 1800s to early 1900s figure skating? So... I actually only know what uh, we talked about in one of the episodes we had last summer, which was about uh, gender in figure skating, where you did mention some of this stuff. Um, so, but yeah, that's that's all I know, literally. <laughs> well, it's a good starting place. So yes, today we're going to be talking about early figure skating, and specifically, we're going to be talking all about Madge Sires, who was a British figure skater. She was predominantly competing in the early 1900s, and she was the first woman to ever compete in an ISU championship, and the first woman to ever medal at one, and she was also the first ever ladies figure skating Olympic champion. So we're going to be talking all about her, and just the early history of figure skating in general. You excited, Tilda? I'm really excited, and also because you've said that it's very whack, so so oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you know, you set my expectations high, so I'm really expecting <laughs> you to step up your game, Evie. Okay, okay, I can step it up. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so let's just start off with like a general kind of primer. So about the early competitions in figure skating. So skating competitions around the time of the ISU's inception, so, you know, late 1800s was when the ISU was created. They weren't actually segregated at all by gender. Both men and women competed on the same competition competitions in the same level and they compete they allowed them to compete at the world championships together in the same categories too when they started in 1896 uh however no women actually competed until 1902 when madge entered for the first time so it was kind of like a we're not specifically saying that women can't enter the world championships but we kind of not, we're not expecting any of them to actually give it a shot. Okay, so how come women weren't competing? Well, it was just that the, the clubs in figure skating, the historical clubs that were mainly in uh, England and in Europe and also in North America, they were mainly populated by upper class white men and maybe their wives, but for the, a long period of time, it was very clear that this was a men's sport. So it was a boys club and women were sort of like implicitly kept out. Exactly, yeah. They were they were allowed to join uh, clubs. They weren't allowed to join immediately. It took quite a number of years for the majority of like the big figure skating clubs to accept women to join and train with them. But yes, for the majority of the time, women were practicing their figure skating in these clubs, but they were never really competing on like an international level. And there were kind of two predominant styles of figure skating that were present in this era. So there was the British style, which was uh, focused more on like the performance of figures. And it was very kind of, I guess the right word would be proper 
because it was very much like, look, we can't have any kind of like flourishes or crazy artistic movements. This is, we have to kind of, you know, protect our late Victorian like image of, yes, I am a proper man who will skate in a circle and maybe I will jump over some hats stacked on the ice, but that will be it. Hats? Yes. Uh, One of the, I think it was the (laughs) Edinburgh Skating Club. Apparently one of their initiation things for testing to see if people could get into their club was they stacked three hats on top of each other and the men would have to jump over them to show that they were okay at jumping. No. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I all I'm saying is bring back the hat jumping and figure skating. I think it is time that we introduce hat jumping. That's all I'm yes. saying. Yes. I'm all for this. It's like hurdles on ice. What to base value would you give that? Oh, uh, obviously <laughs> it would be extremely high. It would be like 15 points, obviously. Yes. Good. It would be fantastic, yes. Hats on the ice, 2K19. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but yes, it was very, the British style of skating was very prim, proper, and obviously because it was the late 1800s to early 1900s, when people did skate, the majority of the time the men were all in like full suits and the women were in, you know, long dresses. So obviously, you know, the British style, parts of it were reflective of that because you obviously couldn't move a lot when you were wearing these kind of clothes. And so the like artistic side of things couldn't really be explored, I guess, because, you know, how much can you wave your arms and stretch out your legs in a full three piece suit? Not much. And then the other side of things, the international style of figure skating, which is more reflective of what we have in the sport today. It was, you know, focused on performance, interpretation, you know, expressing things to music. You know, it was more performative, less athleticism focused. I'm still stuck on the suit thing. Did they really (laughs) wear formal wear when they were competing? I don't know if they wore formal wear, but I guess they just wore like (laughs) normal like suits that they would wear like every day kind of thing. (laughs) They didn't have like Adidas back then. (laughs) (laughs) Ye old Adidas. (laughs) So did the women have to wear like like really like corset things? While skating? I don't think they would wear corsets, but they would wear like the traditional, you know, proper dresses of the time period. So they weren't necessarily like constrictive in the waist area, but that, you know, they gave the like form that would necessarily be like the, the womanly form of, you know, the typical woman in that time period. But it certainly wouldn't be fun to skate with, like, jeez. Now, yeah, I'm understanding more and more why women weren't competing, because that seems like a serious disadvantage to me. Yeah, and they obviously, they couldn't really make the dresses, like, shorter or anything, because, you know, the morals of that time period, I mean, God forbid you show your ankles at a figure skating competition. (laughs) I guess they couldn't wear pants either. No, 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 of course (laughs) they wouldn't. Oh boy, it was just a whole thing. But yeah, those were kind of the two predominant styles of figure skating in that era. And they were kind of reflective in the competitions by the fact that, you know, you had the figures as one segment of the competition, and then you had the free skating. And obviously figures were uh, cycled out of competitions in the uh, 90s and uh, obviously are not a thing in the sport anymore. But free skating is very much still here. So yes, it was the sport was quite different back then. And there weren't many ladies practicing figure skating. Again, it was mainly a very high class sport, as it kind of is still now to this day. But yeah, it was mainly for upper class white individuals uh, who had the time and the expenses like, needed to practice the sport. And so we're going to go into talking about the subject proper of this episode, Madge Sires. The woman so good at figure skating that the ISU banned all women from competing for a short (laughs) period of time. (laughs) So Florence Madeline Cave was born on the 16th of September in 1881 in Kensington, London. And she was the 10th child in her family. Her family had 15 kids. Whoa. I know it's a big family, (laughs) but also it doesn't stop there because she also had 10 step siblings. No. Yeah. (laughs) This is a tangent completely unrelated to figure skate, but I just need to go off on this because I found out this while I was researching. Okay. So Madge's father, right? He had his main wife in, in Kensington with Madge and her other 14 siblings. And he had a second wife in another part of the country where he also fathered 10 kids. So, like, did they know each other? Did the families know each other? No, they didn't. <gasps> they were, it was a secret second family, completely oh. unreal. Like, then no one knew about it until Madge's mother passed away. And literally, like, a few months after she did... 
her father married his like se- secret wife, <gasps> and so you know what a scandal. I'm just I I read about this and I'm like this is the most wild thing I've ever seen. Kind of it was just oh boy the gossip. I'm imagining the gossip, the gossip right now. Yeah, wow. her father was like a he was a builder in London, and his work kind of provided the family with a pretty moderate amount of wealth. Like when Madge was younger. But he did end up actually falling out of his fortune in the early 1900s when he accrued, like, a lot of significant debt from, like, the properties that he was building. And so he lost a lot of his fortune and he was declared bankrupt in 1903. But that didn't stop Madge from, in her early years, doing a lot of different sports. She did. She was apparently a very gifted swimmer and she did equestrian, but favoured figure skating the most out of all of them. So, yes. And obviously it was as a more, like, higher class woman, she was, you know, expected to marry pretty young, settle down, have a family. But she still really enjoyed doing sports and especially figure skating and... When she was a teenager, she met Edgar Sayers, who was a coach at the Prince's Figure Skating Club. Uh, He taught the international style of figure skating, and he ended up teaching Madge the new and developing form that was really becoming popular in Europe and then slowly moving on to England. And she was really a fan of it. She really enjoyed it much more than the British style of figure skating. And she became became very proficient in it. And then when she was 18, I believe, they she married her coach, Edgar, uh, in 1899. Ooh. And she became Madge Sires. And he was actually 18 years older than her. Wow. <laughs> and he would also end up becoming her partner in pair skating when they started doing that also later in her career but yes I have some opinions on that that doesn't sound very healthy well it was also you know the time period it was you know pretty common for the age gaps between the husbands and wives to be pretty much pretty large in comparison to like nowadays so did she have kids she didn't oh. she had no children Madge actually passed away when she was 35 wow and she died in 1917 from heart failure caused either by acute endocarditis or or there is a, also a conflicting source saying that she died in childbirth, but there's like nothing that's been really clear about how she died apart from the fact that she died from heart failure. So yes, she died very young and she actually, she retired right after her first and only Olympics because of her fading health. But yes, they never had kids. But uh, obviously, because Edgar was a coach of figure skating and he was very, you know, adamant that Madge was, you know, onto something, she was definitely going to go places, you know. Cool. He was supportive. I like that. (laughs) He actually kind of persuaded her to, you know, the world's in 1902. It's going to be held in, in England. Maybe you should try and enter. And so she did. She became the first woman to ever enter a world championship in the 1902 worlds because yes her her husband supported her and urged her to enter and she discovered that the isu didn't have any rules technically specifying that competitors had to be male so you know she had a go at it nice and she ended up winning the silver medal right behind ulrich salko who no surprises invented the jump the salko Oh, yeah, my fellow Swede. Your fellow Swede. Yeah. There were only four competitors at this Worlds, but, you know, (laughs) that's still, silver, it's pretty good. (laughs) Yes, yes, it is. A a lot of the officials were kind of taken aback over her choice to compete here, but evidently there wasn't an initial protest given that her uh, skating ability was said to be incredible. And the fact that it was like a home world championships and she, along with Edgar, were prominent members of the British Federation. You know, I don't think anyone was really going to argue with the fact that she was going to enter here. And yeah, she placed second in a field of four. And apparently this is, we've got some amazing details about what she wore and worlds. Ooh, do tell. So apparently she stu- absolutely stunned the crowd with her appearance. She was dressed to the nines in a full length skirt, satin blouse, pearl necklace, hat and leather gloves. Ooh, fancy. I'm sure it must have been a real sight to behold. But anyway, yes, she was amazing. She stunned the crowd with her outfit. Uh, one of the uh, officials at the event, T.D. Richardson, wrote, Rumor, nay more than rumor, a good deal of expert opinion thought she should have won. <gasps> so there you Ooh. go. 
she, that's how good she was. And apparently, this uh, like legend has it that Ulrich Salko actually presented her with his gold medal like after the ceremony as like an acknowledgement of her like dominance in the sport. Like he literally like put it over her head, apparently, which is just wow. We stand sportsmanship. Typical Swede, I tell you. <laughs> We're very good with that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, obviously, she won the silver medal. This was the first time a woman had ever won a medal or even entered in the world championships. And everyone was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And the ISU were like, yeah, this is crazy. We were not expecting this to happen. Maybe we should talk about this at the next Congress. So they did. They were kind of, they were like so alarmed by how amazing Madge's performance was and her like success to like medal there that yeah, they they chose to address the presence of all female competitors in skating wow. at the 1903 ISU Congress. We do have some really great points of debate that were included in the Congress. Okay. Are you ready for this? Brace yourself because they're a crazy wild. <laughs> okay, okay. So <laughs> these were the reasons the ISU Congress were against women competing in figure skating. So the first one, that a woman wearing a dress as opposed to pants prevented the judges from seeing the feet. That's literally it. You know, <laughs> you got, you can't wear a dress. You're gonna. We can't see your feet properly, but also do not shorten the dress because this is the early 1900s. I'm sorry, but like, surely they could see their feet. Like, wouldn't wouldn't they like judge their edge work and stuff? Like, you can see that even with a long skirt, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Were they just complaining for complaining's sake here, or hmm. Hmm, suspicious? Well, guess what? The second point gets even more suspicious. That a judge might judge or favor a woman he was involved with romantically. <gasps> Can't judge someone that you're in, like, you're having a relationship with, evidently. You know, what a scandal that would be. But hold on, isn't that just, like, regular judge's bias that should be, like... Eliminated normally, yeah. I yeah. guess they didn't really have to think about that in those times but yes wouldn't it be like the same thing if your best bud was competing yeah and now the last one the one that kind of sums up the entirety it is difficult to compare women with men is it okay <laughs> i mean the figure skating competitions of that day there wasn't really a difference in what the men and women could do in terms of like technicality because they really if they were jumping at all they were only doing either like singles or half jumps so mm, does that make sense or is that just you know early 1900s era sexism but i mean i'm sure they were dazzled by the beauty of the women and couldn't think straight. oh yeah yeah, and of yeah, course, yeah, all of the course. judges back then were men, so yeah. you know Whew. that kind of bias. I mean, oh, if we see a beautiful woman skate, we might be inclined to mark her better than the men. Anyway, after a long amount of debate at this Congress, uh, they voted three to six in favor to ban all women from competition in figure skating for the foreseeable future. So yes, they all women were banned from competing at the World Championships after 1903. And interestingly, the British Federation was actually one of the like major op opposers to this. They weren't really keen on it, mainly because they had Madge, who was win like winning medals at Worlds now. You know, she had also won a variety of uh, British skating championships and was doing really well. And obviously, you know, they've got the star skater. They don't want her to get banned from the biggest competition of the year. That's just bad business. Right. Yeah, of course. And we actually have uh, some protests from him that were uh, recorded in the minutes of the Congress uh, saying that the idea that the dress prevented the judges from seeing the figures was absurd. Just require that the dress be short because you can't see figures in long dresses anyway. I like this dude. He also said... If a man is so dishonorable to judge a woman that he has an attachment with, his skating association must certainly step in and prevent it. You know, that makes complete sense. Wow, yeah, of course. Logic. <laughs> and then, to finish off, he said, If it is so difficult to compare women with men, then just judge women in every aspect the same as men. So there you go. <laughs> this guy... Round of applause. This guy gets the award for being sensible. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I can just imagine, like, the snark when he speaks. Yeah, okay. I mean, mm-hmm. like, uh, guys, you know, we can just judge them the same way. They're basically <laughs> doing the same stuff. I mean, is, I'm, is it just me or is this not an issue? I mean, what are we doing here? <laughs> Well, I'm glad that someone saw it, you know. Exactly, someone saw it, but his vote and was obviously not enough to turn the tide of the ban, which did go into effect. And Madge, in response, actually did some crazy thing to, you know, counteract it. So in retaliation, she actually shortened her skirts to, like, mid-calf, so no one could complain and her feet were not visible. <gasps> mid-calf, Evie. I know, you could see your ankles! Who would have thought ankles? Anyway, she shortened the dresses to mid-calf and she kind of set that as like a trend in women's figure skating in those kind of years. She actually competed and won the 1903 Swedish Challenge Cup, which despite its name was actually the former name of the British Figure Skating Championships. Yes, she won there in a mixed field of competitors and then she won it again in 1904. Funnily enough, Beating her husband in the process. Yes. <laughs> this is what female liberation is all about. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to remember that, you know, in the early 1900s, the women's suffrage movement in the UK was definitely in full swing. The first, like, large procession of women wasn't until uh, 1907, but it was still kind of, you know, there was something in the air about suffrage, <laughs> which would be a great title of, like, a book. <laughs> <laughs> and then... In 1905, the British Federation actually successfully lobbied the ISU at the next Congress to allow women to compete again. Although there would be a separate female-only event known as the Ladies' Championship of the ISU. I am, like, insulted that they (laughs) didn't call it Worlds. It's not Worlds, and the the women who win this event are not World Champions. They are ISU Champions. Of course. I mean, like, talk about devaluing the female excellence. They were held in a separate location at a separate time than the main world championships. They didn't even allow them to come to the world championships and compete there? Nope, it was a completely separate event. There was the world championships where all the men could compete, and then the ladies championship of the ISU, where only women could compete. And they were at separate times, in separate locations, no overlap. Oh my god, that's like, <laughs> that's so insulting. For the first couple of years uh, when the competition was taking place, the winners were the ISU champions, not world champions. And then in 1924, it was officially changed to ladies world champion. There was a little bit of change in the air though, because in 1908, the Olympics happened. Oh. This was the first Olympics to feature figure skating. It was the there was only the Summer Olympics back in in 1908. You know they weren't split into summer and winter until much later. But yes, the 1908 Olympics and figure skating was one of the main events, and it was one of, if not the first, I believe, Olympic sport to allow women to compete. Really? Yeah, and there was uh, men's figure skating, ladies' figure skating. Uh, and pairs figure skating as well. They were held in London, and Madge was one of five women competing in the ladies' segment. Her score ended up actually being 207.5 points higher than the woman in second place. (laughs) Which is, you know, a bit of a flex. Okay, cool. Wow. She won by a substantial margin. Not only did she compete and win the ladies' event, but she also competed in the pairs competition with her husband, Edgar. They didn't win, but they did get the bronze medal. So, you know, that's something. That was the Olympics. She was the first ever women's Olympic champion. And then after the Olympics and the fact that, you know, the men's and ladies championships were held, obviously, in the same place because it was the Olympics. Uh, A few years after that, the ISU merged the ladies championships of the ISU into the world championships as a a separate segment. And yes, they were all together. And yes, as I said before, she did retire right after the Olympics because of her health issues. She did, uh, in her retirement, in her post-career, she uh, actually authored a couple of books with her husband, including titles such as The Book of Winter Sports, which detailed techniques of figure skating. And she, yes, she passed away in 1917 from heart failure. And her husband actually outlived her for quite a while. He lived to, to the age of 82 and he passed away in 1946. And he actually remarried a few years after her death to 
a 21-year-old woman named Eva V. Critchell, and he was 58 at the, that time. Wow. <laughs> Another big age gap, you know, some things never change. I wanted to end with a poem that Edgar actually wrote about Madge, and it's called To My Lady's Skates. The praise of glove, of fan, or shoe, full many an ode relates. May not my muse with theme more new commend my lady's skates. F little feet to guide these blades my mistress fair provides, and sweetest of our glacial maids on them serenely glides. Oh, That's cute. Like, I'm... I'm flip-flopping here between between all oh, that's cute and men. <laughs> oh yay, that's all that I had prepared. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evie, for the history lesson. That's all right. I hope you enjoyed the little history lesson. It's been very entertaining and educational. Well, there you go. That was the goal. <laughs> so we're going to have more episodes in the series, I think, is the plan. So uh, please do keep a, an eye out on our Twitter and see if more is coming soon, we hope. If you heard about some obscure historical event about figure skating that you would like us to research and talk about, then, you know, please, please do send it to us. That would be awesome. Please let us know. We'd love it. If you want to get in touch with us, then please feel free to contact us via our website in the lowpodcast.com or on Twitter or Tumblr. And you can find all our episodes on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Big thanks to Bex and Carly who helped me with the research for this episode and to Terry and Neve for transcribing. And if you enjoy the show and want to help support the team, then please consider making a donation to us on our coffee page. And a huge thank you to all listeners who have contributed to our team thus far. You can find the link to all our social media pages and our coffee on the website. If you're listening on iTunes, please consider leaving a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This has been Evie and Tilda. See you soon, guys. (laughs) See you soon. Bye.